I hope that this name of the presentation that um, uh, the main object for this research is not specially um, specifically Ukrainian opera and its types of history, but most importantly, the way an opera is seen today by members of our musical community, authors, managers, musicologists. And as a musicologist myself, uh, it would be fair to start asking my kind first. Uh, the problem with studying Ukrainian opera is pretty much the same as with researching other cultural heritage of the country with long history of colonization. It is an issue of identity and the challenge to accept things as they are. The emergence of an opera in Ukraine was caused neither only by deriving it from the folklore genres as uh, traditional music aesthetical games, rituals, or early aesthetical forms, nor only by pure appropriation of European genres. And exactly this hybridity of roots of Ukrainian opera tears it apart. Um, for some earliest examples of Ukrainian opera, one can say two European, uh, written in common classical style, so why is it actually Ukrainian? For instance, known as the first Ukrainian opera, Demophont was written in 1773 in Italy on metastasis libretto by Ukrainian-born composer Maxim Berezovsky, who spent most of his life working for the Russian Empire. In this case, Ukrainian opera apparently means a part of Ukrainian legacy, first of all. Meanwhile, for a long time in Ukraine, the most popular among amateur musicians were operetta and vaudeville, musically marked as Ukrainian, but less professional, complex to be called operas. But right after the appearance of the first types of classical, professional, and nationally colored operas in music of Lakar Komosky and Lysenko, the genre itself became less important issue than maintaining development of Ukrainian culture in general. The imperial oppression on Lysenko's activities and his contemporaries, then Soviet pressure since 1930s, 1960s, at the most spectacular and social genre, opera became more political and less about art. Such raising national identity changed repertoire of opera houses a lot, and a colonial perspective sadly was there till the recent time. Ultimately, the two representatives of opera genre, listener in Ukraine can hear in each opera house, are simple, comic, quite stereotypical operas in Talka Poltavka and the Brazilianai. The list of other operas arrive from theater to theater. So, in the end, lots of us, musical professionals, do, don't know the history of opera in Ukraine of the last century because lots of undercurrents that are worth attention were unnoticed. We don't know what's the actual legacy of Ukrainian opera we have. Also, that's a huge gap in knowledge in Ukrainian musicology. Frankly, writing critical reviews on opera premieres for the past few years was not that challenging for me when I tried to raise a question about the development of Ukrainian opera until the 2022 premiere, Katerina by or Alexander Rodin on Taras Tevchenko's text. To easily explain my concern, I'll show you three musical examples where 2022 premiere, Katerina, is compared with three different Ukrainian operas of the late 18th century. Especially for this music. Next number. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the third exam. This is between these three juxtapositions um, about one century apart. But despite the obviously different composer styles, the recipher Ukrainian ish opera here seems to be just recent folk rituals and melodies used in the same folk costumes but less traditional, uh, the same symbols. Um, in a few hours later, this day, with National Opera Theatre will show the new version of the most staged opera for past decades, the Project Dadonai, newly arranged by composers Alexander Dmitrosaratsky. The logical question to me uh, that I'm constantly asking myself, what is for? Is there any chance, if there is any chance to write new opera? Um, or what is for if such operas have already existed? And moreover, why do listeners have to go through the nationalization of theaters now when it had to be done at least 30 years ago? In fact, such questions made me finally begin work on lists of Ukrainian operas written for the whole period of time, just to draw for myself the full picture of what contains the history of Ukrainian opera. Without any uh, archives yet, I counted that there are at least uh, uh, 328 Ukrainian operas written from 1773 till uh, 2022. Um, 55 um, when Ukraine was under Russian Empire, 133 for the Soviet period, and 83 operas since the Ukrainian independence. On the other hand, um, on the one hand, it's just statistics, but on the other, it gives you a perspective. Uh, for one, it could be possible to dig from my just um, information about just the name and the original source. Less than third part is written about some Ukrainian places, rituals, historical figures, historical events, or Ukrainian people. Uh, the significant part of works of children's operas or operas for children. Meanwhile, the most celebrated original plot are belong to, no surprise here, Shevchenko, Vogon, Lesa Ukrainka, Ivan Franko, and Ivan Kompirevsky. And these numbers are so far um, just approximate. On the other hand, the way Alexander Rodin, the author of Katerina, um, sees the composition of modern U Ukrainian opera, let's call it traditionalistic, is the only one party. The other two could be represented by works Koshivani and Opera Lingua. Um, the Opera Koshivani uh, by composer Alasan Haikevich and Sergei Zhadan um, was premiered in 2021 in Kharkiv and by its features um, it continues a canon of romantic opera, but change from inside. At least here we can mention expressionistic style and type of plot, using electroacoustic as a part of symphony orchestra, Sprengesang, and non-linear type of plot. Everything happens inside the head of the main character, Wilhelm von Habsburg, Vasil Shivani. And speaking of some features that make a difference in using Ukrainian symbols in this opera, it should be mentioned that writing a story about historical character, they don't do full-scale big heroic opera, but a lyrical psychological drama. The way of implementation of folk elements and some rituals you can hear yourself. 
In contrast to this perspective on developing Ukrainian opera laboratory opera operator co-founded by artistic duo of Ilya Razumika and Roman Grigorev, is a case of that timeline of contemporary opera which experienced a conception of opera deaths being left in the underground. As a true prize, the true piece of postmodernist art, this opera works with canons and stereotypes sarcastically. In the next example, uh, there will be three creatures found, uh, um, who found razors, Vinky, that became a stereotypical symbol of Ukrainian girls in dance collectives in Soviet Union. Like hypnotized in moving in a circle dance under the, I would say, wrecked walls. Um, circle dance or um, reward or tanok uh, is also another symbol of so called shamash. Oh, 
to draw the schema about these three types of developments of uh, contemporary opera in Ukraine, but unfortunately it's a working idea and I have no idea how to call them because I have only the schemas and how does it look like. Um, so generalizing thoughts of this presentation, I'd like to connect them to the main idea. Today, after 23 years of independence of Ukraine, eight years of war and one and a half years of full-scale invasion, as Ukrainians, we understand that that's not the first time Russia destroys our culture, trying to ruin our sovereignty. And maybe not the last time. As such, at such moments, when you are about to lose your identity, what you're looking for is a ground. An answer, who am I? Where did I come from? Often these issues pop up in art and what artists should do is at first reflect on the past. During all the waves of, your, of composers' interest to opera, the easiest way to is happen to be just digging into folk rituals, melodies, symbols, and that's all. There is no sense in being in this time loop any minute more. So I see it's essential to make a collective studies in opera. Is it a time to move on?